fellow botanists. Welcome to our third lecture on major groups of plants. So if you remember previously, we have talked about plants, otherwise known as embryophytes. And our first group of plants were uh, liverworts, mosses, and hornworts, this group over here, and these were the non-vascular plants. Our second group of plants that we talked about uh, were in the vascular plants. And so this is our tree showing all vascular plants. And specifically, we talked about a group of, uh, a couple groups of plants, collectively known as the seedless vascular plants. And these were the lycophytes over here and the manilophytes, this group right here. But our third major group of vascular plants are the seed plants. And so we're going to start taking a look at, a seed, at seed plants today. And in particular, we're going to look at gymnosperms. So this is going to be our third major group right here, our gymnosperms. To our fourth and our final tree for major groups of plants, the seed plants. So we have a number of basal characteristics for our seed plants. And then within the seed plants, we have two groups. Our first group over here are the gymnosperms. And our second group over here would be uh, the angiosperms. And so generally speaking, a gymnosperm um, is a seed. So we're using a very old definition of what the word sperm means. So sperm means seed. And gymno actually means naked or uncovered. So we're looking at naked seeded, seeded plants. Uh, in this lecture, and the next lecture we'll look at uh, angiosperms or covered, contained plants. So we'll begin with some general characteristics. So we'll think about how gametophytes have to change, and there's some very important ways that gametophytes have to change in order for seeds to evolve. And so that will bring us to seeds and pollen. And finally, uh, after thinking about some reproductive characteristics, we'll end by thinking about a few vegetative characteristics that gymnosperms have as well. And in fact, uh, also a lot of our uh, seed plants are going to have too. Uh, after we've talked about general characteristics, we'll mention some phyla. And there are four major um, phyla that we're going to think about. And our first one are, is going to be the uh, cycads, cycadophyta. Um, then we're going to take a look at the ginkgo phyta, the coniferophyta, phyta, otherwise known as the pinophyta. Um, those are synonyms. And finally, we'll take a look at the nidophytes. Major changes of the gametophytes that we need to consider on our way for, uh, towards gametophytes uh, evolving into seeds. And the first is the gametophytes become very, very reduced. In fact, so reduced that they are dependent on the sporophytes. And so this is uh, the third picture over here in our series of pictures that we've seen for our major groups of plants. So if you remember in our non-vascular plants, our bryophytes, our gametophyte, orange tissue here, was supporting the sporophyte, which was the purple tissue. And so the sporophyte was always dependent on the gametophyte. In our seedless vascular plants, um, the sporophyte generation was larger than the gametophyte generation, and our sporophyte generation was capable of living independently of our gametophyte. But our gametophyte was also still capable of living independently of our sporophyte. Now, in our uh, third iteration, we've come full circle, and our sporophyte is not only the dominant generation, but in fact, it is going to support the gametophyte, and the gametophyte is going to be entirely dependent upon the sporophyte. And because it's dependent, it's very small. Our second change is uh, heterospory. And if you remember, heterospory is an evolution of uh, plant reproductive uh, structures, such as there are two spore sizes, a um, megaspore and a microspore. And megaspores give rise to female gametophytes, which produce eggs, and microspores give rise to male gametophytes, which produce sperm cells. So we've seen the evolution of heterospory before in our seedless vascular plants. This is not new, but heterospory is going to evolve again, this time in combination with very reduced gametophytes that will ultimately allow us to produce seeds and a seed is going to be a female gametophyte enclosed by sporophyte tissue. And a male gametophyte um, within the pollen, and so a pollen grain is again going to be a coating produced by the sporophyte. Um, and this coating is going to surround a male gametophyte. So we've see, uh, we can see these changes on our basal um, set of characteristics for seed plants. We have the evolution of heterospory, the miniaturization of our gametophytes, our male uh, miniaturized gametophytes uh, become pollen, and our female miniaturized gametophytes 
with a couple other changes that we're going to mention shortly, um, give rise to seeds. Begin by thinking about seeds. And to understand what a seed is, we have to understand first what an ovule is, because an ovule will mature into a seed. Behind an ovule is that an ovule is an enclosure created by the sporophyte generation that goes around the female reproductive structure, specifically the megasporangium. And so our enclosure is going to be the integument. The integument most likely evolved actually from um, leaves at some point, parts of, of uh, megaphils, folding around a megasporangium. And so if you remember, a megasporangium is a spore container. It's, the, uh, it's a container with spores that are large. Right? So our megasporangium then should contain eventually spores, but we haven't quite got there yet. So everything that we're seeing so far is part of the sporophyte generation. So I've drawn some sort of connector over here to the rest of the sporophyte. Remember our sporophyte's very big, something like a, a pine tree. Um, and then as part of this large structure, it's gonna produce an integument. So that would be a sort of a small part of the reproductive structure, like a small part of the female fine pine cone. So here's the integument layer, and that also is derived from the sporophyte, so it's 2n. And then the outer um, container, the megasporangium, is also 2n. So I've used blue here for all of our 2n, or sporophyte, tissue. The final thing that we're going to have now inside our megasporangium is a megaspore mother cell. And so this is going to be a cell that's 2n. And our megaspore mother cell is a cell that will undergo meiosis to give us our spores. And to show our four spores, I'm going to switch colors now. They're uh, haploid instead of diploid. Of these four spores, only one of them is eventually going to divide. The other three are going to uh, just disappear. So I'll put an X through these. Meaning 1N megaspore is now going to start to divide by mitosis. until eventually the entire megasporangium is filled by these cells that have divided by mitosis. So what are these cells? Well, let's go back to our plant life cycle. If we have a megaspore that divides by mitosis, that ultimately is gonna produce a gametophyte. Specifically, it's gonna produce a female gametophyte. And our female gametophyte is also 1N. Now, what is our female gametophyte going to produce? Well, it's ultimately going to produce gametes, but where is it going to produce gametes? I've left myself a little space down here so I can clearly draw two chambers. And these two chambers are going to be chambers that we know. They're going to contain egg cells, so these are going to be archegonia. And inside each archegonium is going to be an egg cell. At this point, we have an ovule that is ready to be fertilized. Summarize what we've done so far. We're going to begin with our integument, and I've used boxes here instead of circles, so now we're in our, our papal Picasso cubist phase. And so we have our outer integument that is derived from the sporophyte tissue, it's 2n, and then our next box within a box is the megasporangium, again a 2n structure uh, coming from the sporophyte. We have one megaspore, and that's the last uh, surviving spore from our megaspore mother cell that underwent meiosis. And as this megaspore divides many, many times by mitosis, we get a female gametophyte. Here's our female gametophyte. And our female gametophyte eventually produces uh, at least one egg cell. In the case of gymnosperms, it's often two egg cells, each one in an archegonium. And the key is that this megaspore is never dispersed. So this is something that's fairly different than what has been, we've been seeing so far in all of our other plants. Usually our spores, whether megaspores or microspores or just homospores spores of the same size, all of our spores have been produced. Now we're sort of, we're going to hang on to our megaspore in much the same way that a gametophyte at some point um, held on to its egg cell instead of dispersing its egg cell way back in our green algas, particularly in our charon life cycle. Now, this is an ovule. So what needs to happen to an ovule before it can become a seed? And the idea is it has to mature 
And specifically, uh, for it to mature, we need to have fertilization. Fertilization, we need a pollen grain. And I'll talk a little bit more about a pollen grain in just a moment, but a pollen grain is going to contain the male gametophyte. So it too is going to be 1N, and there are only going to be a few cells in this male gametophyte, depending on the species. So for most gymnosperms, you get a grand total of four cells, uh, and one of them is going to be this uh, sperm nucleus. And so a little pollen tube is going to start growing, and a sperm nucleus is going to fertilize one of these two particular egg cells. Um, almost never uh, do you get both fertilized. We'll see double fertilization events when we get to angiosperms. But one of these nuclei is going to be fertilized by, uh, sorry, one of these egg cells is going to be fertilized by our sperm nucleus. And this zygote is going to keep dividing now by uh, mitosis, of course. And as it divides by mitosis, it's going to produce a new embryosporophyte. And I've switched back to blue over here to indicate that our embryosporophyte is now again diploid. So we've gone from a diploid generation through meiosis, producing, we had a megaspore that divided a bunch of times by mitosis. We had fertilization from a sperm cell that was also 1N. This gave us a zygote, our zygote divided by mitosis to give us our embryosporophyte. And our embryosporophyte is feeding on all of these 1N female gametophyte cells. So if you remember the key idea of a plant life cycle, it's that the uh, gametophyte nurtures the embryosporophyte. And so now, even though our gametophyte, our female gametophyte, is entirely enclosed within the sporophyte, its main purpose, in fact, one of its sole purposes really, is to nurture the developing embryosporophyte after fertilization. The thing that we need for maturation to finish is our integument needs to get a little bit thicker. So I'm going to try to draw a slightly thicker integument over here. And the seed coat is going to protect the developing sporophyte, maybe for a few months, um, maybe for many years. So this is a really important innovation that again allows the sporophyte to survive very difficult conditions, very drying conditions, like we would occur, like we would see occurring on land. So to recapitulate, what is a seed? A seed is a mature ovule. And so if this is our ovule right here, I haven't changed anything from here to here, let's see what has changed in our maturation process. Our integument became a seed coat and our egg was fertilized to give rise to a megasporangium. Now we have a seed. This final si slide for ovules and seeds shows us again what we have done and where we have come from in our plant evolution. I showed you this picture earlier, and so this is the progression evolution from non-vascular plants to seedless vascular plants, now to seeds. And you've seen these first two pictures. We'll now end with our third picture to illustrate what's going on here. So in our bryophytes, our seedless vascular plants, we had a dominant gametophyte generation with the sporophyte generation growing out of it. In our seedless vascular plants, we had a little gametophyte over here. And you've seen a little fern gametophyte. And we have a sporophyte little embryo sporophyte growing from the gametophyte that will eventually become this large uh, independent sporophyte. And our seeds now, this is a little uh, pine nut, quote unquote a pine nut, uh, but it's inside of a pine seed. This outer tissue is female gametophyte tissue. So this is the one end tissue corresponding to this tissue right here. Uh, the seed coat has been removed, so we're not seeing any of the sporophyte tissue, just the female gametophyte tissue, but inside is the 2N embryosporophyte. These are little embryonic leaves, an embryonic stem, a, a root that is developing right here. And this is our embryosporophyte that will eventually give rise to the next sporophyte generation. We have a seed. We're also ready to think about what pollen is. So uh, in the same way that a megaspore uh, underwent meiosis to give us a female gametophyte, our microspore is going to undergo meiosis to give us a male gametophyte. But our male gametophyte is going to be even smaller than our female gametophyte. In fact, it's only going to be about four cells. And it's going to be wrapped up inside a sporopollenin coat. And hopefully you remember sporopollenin. 
Sporopollenin was the substance that initially in Chara enclosed the zygote to protect the zygote from drawing, uh, drying out. Uh, and when we got to seedless, uh, when we got to uh, seedless plants, our sporopollenin covered the spores and protected the spores so they could remain uh, resistant to all sorts of environmental stress again, often drying out. Now our sporopollenin coat is going to cover not just a microspore, but in fact the whole male gametophyte, all four cells or two cells of it, um, that are formed from uh, the division of the microspore. And finally, one of these male gametophyte cells is going to become a sperm, it's going to develop as a sperm cell, quote unquote a sperm cell. In fact, it's really going to be a sperm nucleus. So let me just show you a couple of pictures of our pollen cells, uh, sorry, our pollen grains. This would be a pollen grain of a pine. And so notice that the spore pollen coat has little uh, wings over here um, that help it uh, disperse through air. It's carried by wind. And you can see roughly a couple of cells here. So this is not quite a mature pine pollen uh, grain. Eventually the uh, male gametophyte is gonna have a more cells. When a pollen uh, grain um, lands, when pollination occurs, then you start to see pollen tubes form. So here's a pollen tube that's forming. Another pollen tube, and we have a couple of sperm nuclei going down our pollen tube. And one other characteristic about pollen is that pollen can often have very uh, particular um, and unique coats. So these are all a variety of pollen species, um, not just gymnosperms, but uh, gymnosperms, probably mostly angiosperms as well. And these characteristic coats um, are very distinctive of individual species. The last thing I'd like to mention in our pollen slide is a difference between pollination and fertilization. Pollination is the point at which a pollen grain has moved from um, wherever it was formed to uh, the ovule that it's going to uh, fertilize. Right? But at the time of pollination, we don't have fertilization. Fertilization is the point at which our pollen tube grows, our sperm nuclei travel down the pollen tube, and one of these nuclei actually fuses with the nucleus of the egg cell to give us a zygote. That's the point of fertilization. We need to think about, finally, before we move on, the advantages of seeds and pollen. These are extraordinary advantages that have given rise to our most successful groups of land plants. So what makes a seed and what makes a pollen such a good structure to have? And this goes all the way back to our consideration of the problems that plants had as they were evolving from an aquatic environment or as their algae ancestors were evolving from an aquatic environment to a terrestrial environment. We've been working on these problems um, through our non-vascular plants, through our seedless vascular plants, and now with the evolution of seeds, we have new solutions to some of these long-standing problems. So one of our big problems was that lots of tissue was drying out once we were on land. And this female gametophyte, of course, is a very small structure, as you saw, um, and can be capable of drying out. We now are protecting it inside a seed coat, so it doesn't dry out. But perhaps even more importantly, we're protecting our little embryo sporophyte from desiccation and from drying out. And that's even more difficult to do than protecting a female gametophyte, because our young sporophyte um, has um, often can't cover its uh, cells with sort of a waxy cuticle the way maybe a uh, female gametophyte could. So now we can protect uh, our sporophyte from harsh conditions too. And finally, our sporophyte can be dispersed in ways that just weren't possible when our sporophyte actually had to grow from a uh, anchored female gametophyte. Now our sporophyte can be carried in seeds and seeds can be dispersed by the wind, they can be dispersed by animals. So now our sporophyte is capable of moving, you know, potentially hundreds or even thousands of miles. And this was something that we didn't have to worry about in water because our sporophyte, if we had a sporophyte generation, um, could be dispersed uh, by water. Can't be done on land unless our sporophyte can fly. And now our sporophyte can, in essence, fly, or at least be transported by something that does fly. What about pollen? 
Again, we're protecting the male gametophyte as we protected the female gametophyte. And we've also uh, addressed this problem of sperm not being able to move in water. Previously, every sperm cell that we considered, every fertilization event that we considered, still required water, sort of this fortuitous raindrop to land uh, on top of um, an, uh, an antheridium. Sperm cells could swim into this drop of water, and then this drop of water had to make its way to an archegonium, where the sperm cells could fertilize the egg. So even though we were on land, we still were dependent on water, which meant that fertilization didn't happen quite as often, but it still has to happen for the plant life cycle to continue. Now, sperm don't need to swim anymore, right? Because they're going to be carried in these pollen grains, and the pollen grains can again be moved on the wind, they can be carried by animals, etc. So in the same way that our sporophyte can be dispersed through air, now our sperm cells can be dispersed through air too. I did say mostly over here. And so as we look at our first groups of gymnosperms, we'll see sort of residual sperm cells that still have the ability to swim, even though they don't really need to. But eventually, um, they'll lose that in the gymnosperms, and it'll be completely gone by the time we hit our flowering plants. We've got a life cycle now. So what we need to do is put these new innovations, our seeds and our pollen, into the plant life cycle. And at this point, you're probably thinking, I don't think the plant life cycle really looks like our plant life cycle anymore, but it does. So here's a reminder of what our basic plant life cycle looked like in our homosporous plants, right? Remember, we have two generations. We have a gamete, multicellular gametophyte, produces archegonium and antheridium, we have fertilization, a zygote, a sporophyte with a sporangium, meiosis occurs, giving us spores, mitosis occurs, giving us our multicellular gametophyte. In a heterosporous life cycle, which is what we have for seed plants, uh, we have just taken this life cycle and added um, some more specific structures. So instead of a single sporangium, we have a megasporangium with megaspores, a microsporangium with microspores, both produced by mitosis. A microspore that divides by mitosis gives us a male gametophyte with an antheridium and sperm cells. A female a megaspore that divides by mitosis gives us an archegonium. Sorry, it gives us a female gametophyte with an archegonium and egg cell. We still get fertilization, a zygote, and mitosis once again gives us a sporophyte. All right. All we're doing is we're taking this basic plant life cycle that has been updated and we're packaging some of these structures in a new way. And when we package them in a new way, we have the possibility of pack creating one parent sporophyte plant or a couple of parent sporophyte plants. So if we have one sporophyte plant with both megasporangium and microsporangium, we'll say that that plant is monoecious. So uh, EC over here in Greek refers to house. So a monoecious organism is an organism with one house, meaning we have both types of um, spores in a single house. A dioecious organism is uh, an organism with two houses, di is two, and so we're going to have separate plants, separate sporophyte plants, one with a megasporangium, one with a microsporangium. I hope these pictures illustrate the concept of monoecious and dioecious. In a monoecious plant, we have one plant with a megasporangium and microsporangium. In a dioecious plant, we have, sorry, dioecious species, we have two plants, one plant with a megasporangium that's uh, female, one plant with a microsporangium that would be considered male. And as we look at our, several of our gymnosperm phyla, uh, some will be uh, monoecious, some will be dioecious. So this will be a good concept to have going forward and also have be eventually be a good concept to have as we think about diversity in animals too. Finally, let's take this uh, heterosporous life cycle that we've talked about. Let's take the structures of seeds and pollen grains that we've also talked about. Let's put all these together into a single life cycle. And we'll use a pine life cycle as our example life cycle. Again, there are a lot of terms here. I put these terms in blue, even though at this point you've seen all of these terms. But let's take this diagram and let's try to understand how it's all fitting into a, an organism that you are probably, I'm guessing, fairly familiar with. We begin with a pine tree or some other conifer tree. You guys certainly know pine trees. So this is our sporophyte. And clearly our sporophyte is very large. So the whole tree is a sporophyte, and this branch, of course, on the tree is also part of the sporophyte. 
And still part of the sporophyte is this structure that we have long called, or you've long called, a cone. Now this cone is actually sort of the tip of a particular branch. And we can see the tip of the branch right here, and our branch is going to be covered with many um, structures that have uh, sporangia. And so we know this as a strobilus. And we have two types of stroboli on pine. So what we have, what you guys have probably called a pine cone your whole life, is actually the female strobilus. There are also male stroboli, and female stroboli are woodier, and they persist, of course, for um, a long time. They can certainly overwinter. Um, male stroboli are much more ephemeral. You tend to see them only in the spring. And so they, they exist in little clusters like this. So the male strobilus is much smaller, and here's an enlarged picture of the male strobilus. Let's begin with the female strobilus. So if this is a pine cone, let's pull off what is uh, you may be considered to be one scale of the pine cone. So this would be one scale here. And we're actually going to call this an oviliferous scale instead of just a scale. We're going to call it an oviliferous scale because it has an ovule. So remember an ovule is an integument that surrounds a megasporangia. So here is our integument. This inside layer over here is the megasporangium. It's not highly obvious here, but there's a megasporangial layer. And finally, inside the megasporangium is not quite a spore yet, but it's going to be a megaspore mother cell. It's going to be this mother cell that's still 2N and is, um, will eventually divide to produce our uh, spores. When our megaspore mother cell does undergo meiosis, we now have four spores. It's always the result of meiosis. However, remember that three of these, and you can see them right here, one, two, three, three of them will disappear and only one is going to remain. So our megaspore now is 1n. Our megaspore is going to divide uh, many times by mitosis to produce our female gametophyte. And the, you can't see the color chains here very well, but this tissue here is now female gametophyte tissue. It's 1n tissue. At the very base of the gametophyte, you can start to see a couple of chambers developing, and these chambers are the archegonia. So here's one archegonium, here's the other archegonium, and inside each archegonium is an egg cell, and you can see in particular the blue nuclei of each of these egg cells. At this point, we have a mature female gametophyte with archegonian egg cells that are ready to be fertilized, which means that now we need to return to our male strobilus and see how uh, the pine pollen has been developing. On our male strobilus, we have a series of microsporophylls, modified microsporophylls. So each one of these structures over here is a modified microsporophyll. And associated with each microsporophyll is mostly a microsporangium. So here you can see the microsporangium. It's an enlarged version of this structure right here. And inside the microsporangium are going to be microspores that will develop into our pollen grain once we have undergone meiosis. Meiosis happens, we get one microspore uh, inside a sporopollen coat, but this one microspore is going to divide uh, a couple of times, giving us uh, just a four cell male gametophyte in gymnosperms, uh, and this becomes our pollen grain. So our pollen grain at dispersal is going to get carried by the wind, and I'm showing it right over here. This is our male gametophyte, and it's going to hang out through all of these sequence of events. And so I finally drawn an arrow all the way down here just to remind us that it's still here. It's still hanging out. And at this point, a pollen tube is going to grow. You can see a very small pollen tube. And at this point, we're just moments away from fertilization. When the sperm cell fuses with the egg cell, that gives us fertilization and a zygote. Our zygote is then going to divide by mitosis, giving us our embryo sporophyte that will stay in this uh, embryo state, sort of an arrested development, for quite a while, potentially over winter, potentially many years, and will become the seed. So now our seed, with the embryo sporophyte, is this structure. It has a seed coat, and the seed coat can be fairly elaborate. So in uh, pines, notice that our seed coat at the bottom of the seed over here is sort of plain, but it sort of develops this uh, wing-like structure, and we have two seeds per oviliferous scale. So oviliferous scale side view, oviliferous scale top view, and this seed coat then helps to disperse our 
seeds by air. So our seed dis becomes dispersed. Eventually, it will germinate, hopefully producing our new little, or the little embryo sporophyte will begin to grow again and become a much larger sporophyte. So our whole life cycle, um, we have added some structures, but it's still the basic plant life cycle. If we go back, it's still this life cycle right here with an update for heterospory and the addition of a few structures. So in the life cycle that I drew you, this is a monoecious species. We have a single pine tree with both a um, with megasporangia in a female strobilus and microsporangia in a male strobilus. But along the way, we might see situations where there are only uh, where there are some species with only female uh, strobili and other species with only male strobili. I've also tried to point out the ploidy of each of these structures, whether it's haploid or diploid. So make sure that you also are thinking about the ploidy, because if you're thinking about the ploidy, you're thinking about which generation each of these tissues belongs to. We can end our consideration of general characteristics by thinking about vegetative features. And there are a few vegetative features worth pointing out. The first one is that all of our gymnosperms, and in fact, all of our seed plants have megaphils. Remember, a megaphil is a leaf that's large, and what makes it large is that it has more than one vein. And our leaves now can be very large, as we saw with the ferns. So here is a cycad leaf. This whole structure is one leaf, so our leaves are getting pretty large. This is ginkgo, again, a larger leaf. This would sort of be like palm-shaped size. Uh, some leaves even have, like this neophyte over here, have branching veins and look very much like the veins of, of um, flowering plant trees that you see. And finally, we have lots of conifers and our conifer leaves, this needle here is one leaf, our conifer leaves are also megaphils. And you might be tempted to think, well, isn't there just a single vein? And the answer is no, there are actually two. So if we look at a cross section of one of these veins, we can see two clumps of vascular, sorry, a cross section of one of these leaves, we can see two clumps of vascular tissue, a vein here and a vein here. And each one of these veins, interestingly enough, is also associated with a ridge of stomata. So you can see a, a little a stoma here, a little stoma here. And if you look at, uh, I can't show this because my camera's not good enough, but if you actually look at one of these little needles, um, and you can see this in lab, you'll see two little white ridges going down this needle leaf. Each of these white ridges is a line of stomata corresponding to a line of vascular tissue indicating that we have two veins and our leaf is in fact still a megaphyll. All right, so we've got megaphylls. Uh, those are the leaves. How about the stems? The stems are also somewhat different than any stem we've seen before. In our seedless vascular plants, most of our stems were rhizomes. They were underground stems. Uh, we did see a few examples of structures that were more upright. Uh, for example, we saw stems in our uh, this, uh, extinct lycopodium uh, trees. Uh, we also saw tree ferns that aren't technically trees, but they, they do have sort of longer structures. They're actually um, in part root as well. But now we're going to have uh, stems with vascular uh, and cork cambia. And so vascular and cork cambia are meristems. They're regions of undifferentiated cells that are going to thicken the stem. We've talked about apical meristems that allow plants to grow up um, or produce branches from side to side. These uh, can be are going to allow our stems to go from being really narrow to much thicker. And we'll talk more about cambia later. But the idea is the cambria produces lots of this secondary xylem over here that allows us to get really thick, really big stems and tree trunks. Lots of secondary xylem with lots of lignin. And finally, uh, we're going to see uh, roots but roots that have a different structure. So instead of being a bunch of roots that come out of stems, um, which we call adventitious roots, we're going to see a tap root. So the idea behind a tap root, we have ground, we have a stem above ground, and then beneath the stem we have a single root, which is our tap root, and maybe we can have some branching uh, lateral roots coming off of this. But this would be our tap root. Or gymnosperm uh, phyla, and I'll briefly mention each of these. We consider to be this. We consider the psych, uh, psychatophytes to be the most ancestral of all of the phyla, for reasons that I'll get into in just a second. 
Our second phylum is the ginkgo phyta, uh, and it's going to have a little bit uh, different um, structure of the trunk that allows it to have more xylem. Then our final two phyla over here are the coniferophytes, otherwise known as the, the pinophytes, and the nidophytes. And these two over here, uh, it turns out, have non-modal sperm, as I'll explain in a second. And our nidophytes have uh, a particular type of xylem cell that looks sort of like vessel elements. And angiosperms have vessel elements. I'll explain what a vessel element is when we talk about angiosperms. But um, for a long time, people thought that nidophytes were actually closely related to angiosperms because of these vessel-like uh, structures in the xylem. And the most recent thinking is that these vessel-like elements have actually evolved um, their homologous structures. Um, it's sort of a convergent evolution phenomenon, but um, that's why uh, neophytes are considered to be uh, one of the more uh, derived groups of gymnosperms. Here are some great looking uh, cycadophytes. And many of our uh, cycads are large trees. So we're, so we're seeing large trees now. So notice these, these very thick uh, trunks over here. Uh, there are still some cycads that are, are growing close to the ground, but, but most of them are, are much larger. And uh, our cycads uh, have these huge megaphyll leaves. And if you look at the ends of branches, you can kind of see a little bit right here. If you look at the ends of branches, you can see either a, a female uh, series of um, megasporophylls, or if they're all clustered together, as we have here, we have a female strobilus. Or if we look on a different tree, we can see these very long cone-like structures, which are the male stroboli. So because we have some cycads that have female stroboli, others that have male stroboli, um, our cycads are dioecious species. And um, one of the reasons that we think that uh, cycads are a little bit more ancestral, um, first of all, we see that they tend to be a bit older in the fossil record. So they go well into the Jurassic period. Uh, if you ever want to plant your own Jurassic Park, um, plant lots of cycad trees. You don't need the dinosaurs. They just eat California. The trees are, are much friendlier. But the trunks of these trees are not nearly as thick. They're not full of nearly as much secondary xylem as our ginkgo trees are going to be, as uh, other conifers are going to be. And so for these reasons, uh, people think that cycads are a little bit more ancestral. And um, if you look at the actual fertilization event, the sperm cells, as they go down the pollen tube, they're actually still swimming. So we have modal sperm cells, which seems to be a bit more of an ancestral characteristic. Our second phylum is the ginkgo phyta. And these are lovely trees, particularly in the fall. We have several around campus. They have very yellow leaves. Um, their leaves haven't started turning yet, so these are our trees. I couldn't take a picture of them for this lecture, but we have a, a great tree that's just outside the mulberry um, and a few others that are around campus. One that's behind Night Hall. It's a pretty nice tree as well. Like our cycads, our ginkgo phytes are dioecious. So in other words, we have a male tree with a male strobilus. So here's the male strobilus. We have a female tree with a female strobilus that's very reduced. So the whole female strobilus is this structure right here. It's basically a single stalk with a pair of ovules. So those are the pair of ovules on this single, very small strobilus. So notice that our stroboli are becoming a lot more reduced um, than they were uh, even in uh, the cycads. Each of these ovules is going to become a seed, and our seeds tend to be very fleshy. Um, so instead of uh, pine seeds that have had that, that um, uh, wing-like covering, um, these are going to have uh, the outer seed coat is actually going to be in a couple parts, a fleshy part and then a harder part, and the um, female gametophyte is going to be inside this harder part. And people think that the idea is that this fleshy part was actually uh, a seed dispersal mechanism uh, for our seeds. So let me move so you can uh, see these a little bit better. Uh, the idea is that an animal would eat one of these seeds, um, get the food by digesting the outer fleshy seed coat. This inner hard seed coat would pass through the digestive system of 
of the animal would be dissolved by the stomach acid. And then when it came out the other end of the digestive system in a nice pile of fertilizer, uh, the little embryo sporophyte inside would be all ready to grow and would have a great place to start growing. And this apparently worked very well. Um, there were lots of ginkgos for a, a long time in the fossil record, but we're down now to just a single species in this entire phylum, or, or one species of ginkgo. So this whole phylum almost went extinct were it not for this one species. The species now that we plant all over our, our parks, um, all over the world, uh, these are in Korea, um, there are a lot of trees in Japan as well, and China, and now they're being planted across North America. And the reason they, this, these trees don't become invasive is that whatever animal at some point apparently ate the seed and had it pass through the digestive tract is no longer with us. That animal, whatever it is, is extinct. And so ginkgo trees were on the verge of becoming extinct too until humans started to plant them and actually soak the seeds in acid to uh, soften the seed coat before it's planted. So uh, ginkgos are sort of our first example of a rescued or conserved, one of our first examples of a rescued or conserved species by humans, which I think is kind of a neat story. And uh, in many cultures, uh, they still eat the fleshy seeds of ginkgos. So if you go into a number of um, uh, Chinese or Japanese grocery stores uh, in Lexington or Louisville, uh, you can find canned ginkgos. Interesting to have. Third phylum of gymnosperms are the pinophyta, uh, and a synonym for them is the coniferophytes. So your textbook uses coniferophyta, I believe. Um, I'm using pinophyta, that's the more recent uh, term, which is in line with the International Botanical Congress's naming standards. And these are the uh, gymnosperms that you're probably most familiar with. So these are the pines, spruces, firs, junipers. We have lots of these across campus. These are in our forests um, in eastern Kentucky and western Kentucky. And they produce, um, the reason they, they're called uh, conifers is that they produce these cone-like structures. Uh, in this case, these are the female strobili, as we saw. Here are the much smaller male strobili. Great picture of them side by side. Um, so that's their name. And what this, uh, distinguishes uh, our pinophytes from our two previous phyla, our ginkgos and our cycads, is that the sperm cells now aren't modal. They're actually not swimming down the sperm tube. Um, they're sort of going with cytoplasmic flow down the sperm tube until they can fertilize the egg cell. So I won't show you lots of pictures of all of these because you're familiar with these, um, you know pine trees. The one picture of a pine, a uh, nephrophyte, that I'd like to show you, is the Wilhelmina, what's known as the Wilhelmina pine, Wilhelmina nobilis. And there's a really interesting story behind this species as well. So for a long time, um, there were lots of these species that were preserved in the fossil record, um, dating back um, into the uh, Cretaceous. And so people thought that they were extinct because they'd only seen them in the fossil record. However, uh, a few decades ago, um, a population of Wilhelmina pines was actually found in a very remote park in Australia. And uh, in fact, they were, um, so they were self-propagating and um, rangers were actually able to collect the seeds and start growing them as well. So if you would like to grow your own Wilhelmina pine, you can do that. Uh, I think the, the seeds aren't cheap. Um, I think you can get them for, uh, you know, uh, 50 to to $100, but um, why would you want one of these? Well, think of it like this. Have you ever heard the legend of the Loch Ness Monster, this dinosaur that used to live in a lake, or supposedly lives in a lake in Scotland? Uh, clearly not happening. We don't have dinosaurs with us right now. But if we go back to the Cretaceous, when we did have uh, dinosaurs in the Cretaceous, we also had Wilhelmina pines. And so this park in Australia is basically like the plant version of Lake Loch Ness. We have organisms that we thought were extinct from uh, uh, well over 65 million years ago, and it turns out that they aren't. So this is our plant version of the Loch Ness Monster. As I said, you can grow it for under $100 if you want to, or if that's a little too pricey for you, uh, 50 cents will buy you uh, an Australian stamp with the Wilhelmina pine on it. So I thought that was a, a neat story. And our last phylum of gymnosperms are the neophytes. There's no good place for me to hang out, so let me move down here. 
The one thing I'm going to say primarily about the neophytes is that they're a crazy group, but they do look um, in some ways similar to flowering plants. And you wouldn't necessarily see that for all of these groups over here. Um, but uh, if you look at the leaves, for example, of our needum species, you'd, you'd think that these leaves are very much the have a, a branching vascular pattern characteristic of our, our flowering plants. I mean, this would look like a, you know, a, a leaf of, you know, any one of a number of trees you'd see all over eastern Kentucky. All right. Another characteristic they have um, that, as I mentioned, people thought for a long time um, made them more closely related to angiosperms is they have vessel elements, which is a particular type of cell in the xylem. All right. But it turns out that this is probably an example of convergent evolution. However, as similar as some of these plants may look to flowering plants, they are in fact uh, conifer, uh, sorry, they are in fact gymnosperms. So we can see stroboli over here, female stroboli, male stroboli, that give rise to naked seeds. In fact, these look somewhat like the cones of coniferophytes. So um, what are some examples of some of these um, neophyte plants? Uh, this is an example of Wellwichia. And so this is a single plant. It looks crazy, and it's even crazier because all of this sort of tangly green stuff is a single leaf. And so this whole plant, its whole life, only produces one leaf. It grows in deserts, particularly the Saharan Desert, and it has this really long taproot that just goes down, I mean, dozens, hundreds of feet into the, the soil of the Saharan Desert, which allows it to get water. And it doesn't uh, produce a lot of leaves because producing leaves is a very difficult thing to do in the Saharan Desert. So it just produces this one leaf that never really quite completely disappears. It just sort of gets, uh, it blows around in the wind in these sandstorms. It gets all torn up, um, but it still keeps photosynthesizing and eventually produces these reproductive structures. So here you can sort of see this single leaf right here. And you can see how shredded it gets around the edge. And here are, a little, uh, here are some stems with stroboli. Uh, a plant that we actually do have in North America is ephedra. And they're not around here, but they are out west. Uh, in fact, they grow all over the west. Um, if you go on Dr. Stevens's paleobiology trip to the west, uh, at some point you'll probably trip over an ephedra plant. So they look uh, a little bit like um, uh, other um, gymnosperms in that they, you know, don't really have big leaves, they have, but they produce these little uh, stroboli. So you can see a little stroboli that are produced on them. The stems are green and do a lot of photosynthesizing. Um, they're uh, sort of a, a shrubby plant in terms of height. The interesting thing about ephedra, as you may have guessed from the genus name, is it gives us a drug. It gives us ephedrine. And of course, you can modify ephedrine. You can have pseudoephedrine as well. And ephedra is used in cough syrup. It also is used in uh, methamphetamines. And so uh, technically, it's illegal to move ephedra across state lines, uh, which is why we can't buy plants and show them to you in lab. But maybe we'll be able to um, uh, grow an ephedra plant at some point. It's also called Mormon tea uh, because in the Mormons, uh, without really knowing what they were doing, uh, would uh, take this plant. Um, they were looking for something to flavor their water. Um, they'd stick uh, ephedra into the water uh, of their tea, their hot water of their teas, and um, they liked the taste and they really liked the way they felt after they drank the tea. And a third genus is Needham, and we don't have any Needham around here. This is a tropical genus, but again, I just wanted to, to mention this because we can see in Needham these leaves that start to look very similar to angiosperm leaves that we're going to see in our next unit. Although, of course, it's still uh, a gymnosperm, a naked seeded plant, and you can see a bunch of um, ovules maturing into uh, seeds right here. These are less mature ovules right here on stalks, um, just as we would have maybe for um, our um, ginkgos or uh, a variety of other gymnosperms. So, if you would like to, um, some point uh, you can continue filling out this chart. We've talked about non-vascular plants, seedless vascular plants, and now gymnosperms. So think about the taxa and which taxa have these particular characteristics. This is the end of our gymnosperm lecture. Uh, hope you enjoy learning about the naked seeds and our next plant will cover up uh, our next lecture will cover up our seeds and give them flowers and talk about